Right, I think we should get started because this is going to be a short and sweet webinar. Uh, my name is Anita Harriet. I am president of Palmall Art Advisors. I run North America for the firm. And we also have John Wiley from Haggerty. Uh, today we will be discussing what we call next generation collectors. Uh, we're focusing on millennials and Gen X collectors. What are they looking at in the car market? What are they looking at in the art market? We're going to provide you a little insight and some tools also to, you know, help one understand the best way to acquire some of these assets. Um, our topics today will be the following. One, we're going to talk about the NFT scenario. So what is happening with NFTs? Why is there such a significant increase in value for these non uh, fungible tokens? In addition, we're going to look at the impact of COVID briefly and how that's impacted online buying. We're going to focus in on the millennials in particular because they've made a huge impact um, lately, both in the art market and the car market. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of social media um, as a new avenue for gaining information for a lot of millennials and Gen Xers. Um, very quickly, uh, John, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm a manager of valuation analytics at Haggerty. I've been with Haggerty for about four years now, and um, we cover the entire market, not just in North America, but um, all over the world. So um, we have monitor lots of auctions and also use our policy data to understand what's happening with uh, with collectors and which vehicles are interested in. Yeah, John, um, what he does is absolutely incredible. We will any car, any value really understanding nuances, we can go to John and they've done the analytics. So really, really good source of information as it relates to cars. Um, can you go to the next one, Elizabeth, please? All right, so first let's talk about millennials. Um, there's been an incredible uh, increase in millennial participation in the art market. And, and of course, I'll turn to John in a moment to talk a little bit about as it relates to cars. But um, when the pandemic was you know, raging and we were all worried that the art market would collapse completely, uh, we saw a remarkable um, participation of millennials in acquisition of art. And quite a few statistics have analyzed this. And, and of course, if any of you are um, running a family office or your wealth advisors or, you know, you know, or accountants, you know, focus on your millennials because while everyone else was, you know, nervous about buying, millennials were online buying art. Um, a couple stats that I think are really, really important. 70% of millennials report um, that during the pandemic, they increased their interest in collecting art. So a lot of that was being on the computer with nothing to do um, and seeing what was out there. But the more interesting statistic is traditionally the boomers have been the big buyers in the art market. And what we saw was that um, 60% of millennial collectors say they're optimistic about the market's performance in the next six months to a year, while only 24% of boomers. And I will be able to give some insight into that as we just were right in the middle today of our most important uh, art auctions in the art marketplace. Um, and we've we've really been tracking what the sales prices are for those pieces. Um, and just in a general sense to understand that millennials between born between the 80s and late 1990s make up the largest consumer group today. So we're seeing a lot of focus on them as in their potential buying power. Uh, and last but not least, 79% uh, of millennials said they purchased an artwork in the last 12 months. This is absolutely remarkable. And there's directly a correlation between for sure millennial interest in the art market online buying and the rise of the NFT. You go to the next one, Elizabeth. John, tell us a little bit about what millennials are doing in terms of co collector cars. Yeah, I mean, the issue that we've had a lot in the last several years with millennials is the misconception that they don't like cars or they don't like to drive and or they don't wanna own cars. And while that might be true in limited cases, I think people are becoming more aware that that's really not the case, and especially not the case when it comes to enthusiast vehicles. So these are vehicles that you don't drive to work uh, for people that are still going commuting to work, but um, it's these are fun vehicles. And what's interesting is that millennials like a pretty wide range of vehicles, not just those that were new when they came out, when they got their driver's license, but 
vehicles like the first generation 1965-1966 Ford Mustang. Uh, this is, you know, a vehicle that's um, 15 years older than even the oldest millennial. So um, it's a range of vehicles. Uh, there's also, they have some distinctive picks. So on the right column, those uh, vehicles like the Nissan Skyline, Honda Civic. Um, Anita, I know that you're a little bit surprised about that pick, but also the Mazda RX-7. Um, these are vehicles that millennials often played in video games, and so they're uh, sort of have unique interest in those, whereas the older generations, Gen X, uh, boomers especially, just don't quite see the same appeal or just don't know about them as much. And what's the, just very quick question, John, what's the range in, in cost, um, you know, between yeah. the 19th and Ford and a, you know, Honda Civic? I think that's the interesting thing here is that all, even though these vehicles are pretty diverse, um, most of them you can find a pretty nice one for under 50,000, which is sort of a good entry point for a uh, enthusiast vehicle. Certainly it goes up to tens of millions of dollars for, you know, sort of 1960s, 1950s Ferraris. Um, but it's, I think a lot of enthusiasts uh, kind of get started in that 25,000 to $50,000 range. And last question, where would you typically find, for instance, like a, a Mazda RX-7? Would that be like within the private collector market or would you go to an auction for that? Yeah, well, unfortunately, with online auctions and with social media, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, there are increasingly more and more places to find these vehicles, and they're getting a little bit more segmented. So it's you have to potentially find the right place to find the RX-7 or find the uh, Ford Mustang. So, um, so the, but with the internet, that's uh, easier and easier to do. Thanks. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, can you go to the next one, please? Good. So I want to talk a little bit about social media um, because there's a direct correlation between social media and these extraordinary prices we've seen for NFTs, but not just for NFTs, really for art buying in general. Um, now, while most baby boomers would, wouldn't be caught dead on Instagram trying to understand, you know, who's the most important artist, um, we see a lot of influencers having a huge impact on the decision making for Gen Xers and some millennials as well. And I just wanted to give you a quick example that we, you know, we that, you know, I've seen, you know, over and over again. So Paris Hilton is a big influencer as it relates to NFTs. She has been pushing NFTs for some period of time. And as a result, um, her NFT sold you know, have sold in the millions. So these influencers, what we see is everyone getting on every day. They look at their favorite gallery. They look at their favorite artists. They follow their artists. They want to feel like they know their artists. This is very different um, from the baby boomer generation that might, you know, just go to go to the gallery or go go to the auction. They're fine getting their information online through um, social media. So it's, it really is quite a big difference. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, yeah, thanks. Um, go on. Yeah, it's, um, it is. It's interesting here with Instagram and other social media platforms because it is a way to find information on things, uh, vehicles coming up for sale potentially sooner. Uh, the picture of the car on the left is unusual because it's a 1955 Ferrari 250 um, GT Europa, which was original unrestored condition and found, I think, in San Diego. Um, it actually recently sold at auction um, some subsequently, so I think your first chance at buying it was through social media. Um, and this car sold for a little over $2.2 million at an online auction run by this Gooding & Company. So, um, so this, it's a example of social media sort of potentially leading the rest of the market um, in opportunities. Um, the, the chart on the right shows the growth in those online auction sales. So this just starting in January of 2020, um, online auction sales in North America uh, were totaled $400 million by the end of the year. And you can see that the sort of the live auction sales is still ahead uh, for most of the year, but it's Online auctions really are almost a huge, um, almost the majority of the market at this point in time. Yep. Can you go to the next one, please, Elizabeth? 
Now, we've seen the exact same thing happen in the art market. What's particularly interesting is that when we tracked um, with the onset of COVID, um, we tracked what happened in the marketplace. And what we saw was that there was a big decrease in supply of pieces that actually went to market. And that's for obvious reason. There was this notion that no one would buy online or a seller wouldn't achieve the amount of money they were hoping to achieve at auction. Um, so there was a contraction. However, what we saw was a huge increase in online acquisitions and Sotheby's got out in front of that before all the other auction houses. So looking at 2019, 69 million dollars of, of purchasing um, overall value um, in the online auction marketplace. Within the first half of 2020, that had risen to $412 million. Now, I don't know um, if any of you were on the major auctions, the Christie's 20th, 21st century sale, um, or the Sotheby's uh, very important sale as well. I mean, these it has gotten to be a scenario where they have turned um, their sales into an online, an ability to acquire you know, 10, 20 million dollar works online, you don't need to sit in an auction house and with all the bells and whistles um, of what you would experience in the auction house. So there's a what we're seeing is that not only are millennials comfortable buying online, but we're starting to see that baby boomers are gathering some comfort around that as well. Um, however, when I look at the artists that are traject or moving upwards in value. That's very much because the millennials are pushing those prices higher. And that is primarily because of a comfort of buying online. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Now, I wanted to give you some examples of where, you know, when we work with next gen um, collectors, where we like them to start, and then obviously where we hope they will end. And a good way, um, if you're entering the marketplace, and you are a young collector, we really, really recommend you look at the prints, uh, the print medium as a really good entry point. And here's an example of kind of three David Hockneys, two are prints and one is a painting, and you can kind of watch the differential in value. Note what John said, um, millennial buyers tend to buy in that under $50,000 mark. And we see the same thing with millennial buyers of art. They don't tend to spend $5 million on a work. They like to work in that under $100,000 realm. And prints are the best way um, to buy an entry level piece with ROI over time. And I'll give you an example. So here we have a David Hockney. Um, this one sold for 60,000 in 2021. Um, the same work, if we were to look about 10 years earlier, would have tracked much lower, right? Probably in the $40,000 mark. The second one is a better example. This is part of David Hockney's Yosemite series. I sold one of these prints to my clients. I actually encouraged all my clients to buy them um, in 2017 for $100,000. And this same print made on an iPad signed by David Hockney just sold for $400,000 in 2020. So, you know, the, we really do encourage prints as a great entry point. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? And I'm going to give you one more example um, with Keith Herring, another artist that um, many millennials are very interested in, um, primarily because it's graffiti art. So here's an example of kind of an entry level uh, Keith Herring at ninety thousand dollars. Again, increased value over time if we track it, and then the next level up um, in terms of an enamel and screen screen print. And this one is eight hundred thousand in twenty twenty. So again, depending on your price point. This is a great way to start your collecting. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, can, yeah, okay. All right, go on, John. Yeah, I think the other interesting thing is the way millennials sort of interact with their cars, and it's maybe even before they own one. Uh, there's several examples of, of different sort of avenues, channels. One is this, uh, it's actually a video game that's called Gran Turismo. Uh, however, manufacturers like Mercedes-Benz and Jaguar and Porsche have worked with a video game producer uh, to create these virtual cars. So these vision Gran Turismo style cars. And it's these cars don't exist in real life, at least initially, 
and they're often not drivable in real life, but they do exist in the video game and you can drive them there. So that's one area. The other, of course, is, is multiplayer online racing. And then one platform that's become pretty popular with that is iRacing. And so anybody from a professional to an amateur can get their own sort of setup and get become have a very virtual, realistic uh, driving racing experience with other participants all over the world and at different tracks and in different cars and things. So it's a very um, sort of virtual way to experience go racing. Um, and racing is, of course, expensive, so it's a good way to get started with that. Uh, and the other way is is what's called the ECU tuning. And so this is more modern cars have a computer that runs the engine, um, and it's a way to improve efficiency and horsepower and things like that. And so it's a, a way for millennials, especially to sort of interact and customize their vehicles um, that wasn't possible before. Um, you can go to the next one, Elizabeth, while I'm talking. I mean, I, I I anticipate we'll be seeing, you know, virtual worlds where you race your cars and eventually people will be buying NFTs where they can have their unique, you know, right, their unique digital car that no one else can have. I, I see this in our future. It is happening. If it, if it, if it isn't happening already. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd give you a sense of what we're seeing in NFT sales. Um, this happened just two days ago. Um, these are the crypto punks, um, and you can track <laughs> their value over time, which has increased absolutely dramatically. They are created by an algorithm, not by an individual artist. Each one is unique and different. And uh, these nine crypto punks uh, sold uh, with premium for sixteen million dollars on May tenth. And again, this is these are. There's no physical art here, right? This is this is an NFT. Um, so you are the only owner of these vir virtual crypto punks. Um, so we continue to see a real interest in NFTs. That being said, um, all is not uh, glorious at when it comes to NFTs. Most of us know that Bitcoin is is experiencing some problems in terms of pricing, and then we also are seeing you know, actually some drops in pricing for NFTs as well. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Um, the other thing, which I think is really had a dramatic impact on the art market. So if we kind of summarize what we've talked about so far, um, we have seen a great interest in things like NFTs among millennials and Gen Xers, fine. We also see that, um, you know, millennials and Gen Xers specifically will buy things kind of under that $100,000 mark. Um, and so prints become a really good place to do that. The other area where they've had a huge influence is in looking at artists that aren't um, traditionally represented in the cadre of blue chip artists. And if anyone had the privilege of walking through Christie's or Sotheby's um, in the previews in the last few days, you would have been blown away by the amount of um, people of color and women represented in the most important sales. Um, it really is quite, quite incredible. And a lot of that is really pushed by um, the millennials who really do want others represented uh, in, in, their, in the art that they acquire. And two examples would be um, the artist on the left, um, a really incredible artist, African-American artist. And this artist sold, um, this uh, African artist, it sold uh, significantly above estimate. And we saw that uh, kind of across the board, we could have a whole presentation just looking at the changes in pricing over time. And then today, uh, Elaine de Kooning, uh, who was, well, let's just say Willem de Kooning was married to Elaine de Kooning. Um, her, she has several works coming up at auction um, and we're bidding on a few and, and there are just so much interest, so many phones, uh, people on the line uh, for her artworks. So whether it's Elaine de Kooning or Joan Mitchell, um, women, African, African-American, people of color uh, are significantly represented um, in a way they've never been in the blue chip art market before. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? So here's a, a list of 10 vehicles, vehicle generations that we've looked at that are aligned sort of which uh, collectors are buying, and in this case, millennials. Uh, these are the top 10 millennial favorites. Um, and what's interesting here are is the mix of vehicles. There's both sort of vintage 1960s, 1970s pony cars and muscle cars, cars like the Ford Mustang, the Chevrolet Camaro, Chevelle, 
Um, there's also a mix of sort of more modern BMWs. Uh, there's a Porsche in there and the 911. However, it's sort of the unloved 996 generation, which I won't get into why, but um, it's a, a little bit more accessible point to get into the Porsche 911 uh, hierarchy. And then also the Ford Bronco, the first generation car. And a lot of these uh, to me are one, they're reasonably affordable. They're also usable, uh, all of them. And so these, to me, it says millennials are buying vehicles to drive and to use uh, for the experience uh, to go to events or drives. Um, they're not necessarily great cars for showpieces. They're not necessarily ones that they would just keep locked up in a garage uh, waiting to collecting dust and waiting to appreciate. So uh, to me, that's millennials are buying things, vehicles for uh, experiences and, and to use and get out and interact with folks. So um, that's, uh, I think, what's John, interesting about money. Yep. John, tell me, so because a lot of these cars are cars that people have used, is it much harder to buy one, you know, in really good condition, in mint condition? Yeah, it's uh, there, that is a trend that we're seeing is that a lot of times these vehicles were sort of used up because they weren't necessarily collectible when they were new. And so finding uh, sort of ones that somebody did keep locked up in a garage and doesn't have very many miles on it, um, that presents issues if you certainly if you want to drive them, um, but the people are willing to pay for those uh, and. But there's also a lot of vehicles that it's most of these have good parts available and you can restore them and fix them. And so it's uh, there you can sort of resuscitate or restore a number of these to make them drivable and usable. And in the market, is there a lot more leeway in being okay with parts being replaced as opposed to original parts with these kinds of cars? Yeah, and certainly with these too, they often make good platforms for modifications. So a lot of these have, you can make them faster, you can make them stop more quickly. Um, so that's, a, and then the other trend, which um, is not necessarily true for these types of vehicles, but in other segments is electrification of vintage cars. So um, cars like sort of vintage luxury cars, Rolls Royces, Bentleys, um, Jaguars too, they're converting them to electric powertrains, uh, and that makes them more reliable, more efficient, um, and more expensive, but it's, uh, that's another trend that's happening in the collector car market. Last question. Since these are cars that people are really using, is it still a collector car policy in terms of risk for these cars? It, it, yes, it, um, it's a, a little bit of a um, strange area, but I mean, as long as you're not driving it to work every day, uh, and driving it on night days, weekends, or to events, um, then we can still consider it as an enthusiast vehicle. So that's the distinction that we want. We and do, what, yeah, what are those it. requirements? Like, where's what's the limit? You know, how often can you drive it for it still to be considered a collector car? Yeah, there's there are limits as to you can't park it on the street. It needs to have a garage or someplace uh, similar um, protected parking. There also, I think it is, it's, you know, you need to have another vehicle to get to work. Um, so that's the other requirement. And there are certain limits as to as to whether or not millennials, it may not be as much of an issue, but if you have a teenage driver in the house that, you know, might be tempted or uh, to take the enthusiast car that's sitting in the garage while their parents are away, um, then that <laughs> might make it difficult to ensure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, we also find that uh, millennials and Gen Xers are really interested in graffiti art. Um, I'm giving you two examples of kind of the penultimate example of graffiti art. Uh, Banksy on the right, and we saw very, very vibrant prices for his works yesterday and the day before. And Cause on the left last year, uh, I think it was last year, there was a world record for a Cause painting. So there are a couple reasons for this. One, um, it very much relates to kind of the imagery that they've grown up with, right? Online and graffiti, et cetera. But also it has to do with um, a lot of young people haven't had um, art history, right? So they don't really have context to connect, um, you know, one artist to the next in building a collection. So graffiti art's very digestible. Um, it's very democratic. Um, and so therefore we see quite a lot, especially male collectors are very interested in graffiti art. Um, 
So you'll find that to be one of the top areas of collecting. Uh, today, Heritage Auctions has you know, their own uh, categories of sale, just looking at what they call street art. So you can buy all levels from pieces at a couple hundred dollars to pieces like the Banksy or the Cause, um, which sell in the millions and millions of dollars. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? So this is a list of vehicles that Agatha we compiled earlier in for sort of those that we felt most confident would appreciate this year. Uh, and so typically most vehicles appreciate, but uh, these were those that we feel are most likely to appreciate. And what's interesting here is just the is the variety of vehicles. So you have cars from Germany and um, Europe, also from America and Japan. And it's you know, there are SUVs, there's a motorcycle, there are sports cars, um, and this I think speaks to the variety of interests and sort of different ways that enthusiasts can have a fun vehicle and and also get out and enjoy them and um, in different ways. So it's a, a interesting mix. And the way that we determine this list too is as through a variety of like pricing trends, but also demographic information. So we can use our policies and call quotes uh, on policies to say millennials are interested in this particular vehicle and we see that it, that interest is growing and that helps us determine that you know or anticipate that the, uh, the they may appreciate in the next uh, 12 months or longer and are these all cars that are kind of below a certain price point or in general no, or are yeah, gonna... there's it's a pretty wide range of vehicles um so something like the number six on the list that 2005 2006 Ford gt that's potentially a 350 to 400 000 vehicle um similar the number two on the list that lexus lfa that's potentially 600,000. whereas something like the audi gt is probably could find a reasonably good one for under 10,000 or certainly under 15,000. so it's a pretty wide range of vehicles uh, in terms of pricing. Got it. That's really interesting. Can you go to the next one, Elizabeth? Okay, a couple of final words. Um, regardless of whether you're buying graffiti art or you're buying, you know, a uh, Honda Civic, which I still can't get over, um, we still do believe that you should buy the best you can afford. Um, and that means looking at those categories mm -hmm. of analysis that determine value. So, you know, condition, um, et cetera. We also um, really encourage you to buy what you love um, because you're going to be living with it if it's a painting. Um, and if you're going to be uh, driving it, that makes it even more fun. Most importantly, we really think you should be seeking advice to determine market value. So, you know, reach out to Haggerty um, if you're looking to understand value. Reach out uh, to an art advisor or to a firm like ours if you're looking to understand what the analytics are, are around the acquisition. So your ROI makes sense, return on investment. And the last thing is we really want to encourage you, regardless of what you buy, um, to ensure for replacement. Um, do you want to opine on that a little bit, John? I think, yeah, well, it's um, insurance isn't quite my area, but it is, I think, helpful to be able to, you know, have a vehicle that you can go out and replace it or have uh, have it insured for the correct amount so that you can go out and replace it in case of a loss. Exactly. You certainly don't want them to pay you market value. You want to be made whole again in case of loss, whether it's art or a car. Um, so look at this. It is 1130. Our 30 minutes has completed. Um, we want to thank everyone for um, coming on this webinar. If you have any questions, follow up questions for John or myself, feel free to just send us an email um, or you can send a chat. We will uh, send a copy of the video um, if you'd like it. Um, Elizabeth will be in charge of that. And um, thank you all for coming. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, John. Yep, thanks, Nina. Yep.